Oh, yay. Oh, yay. Oh, yay. All persons having business before the Honorable, the United States Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit, are admonished to draw near and give their attention, for the court is now sitting. God save the United States and this Honorable Court. Be seated, please. Case number 22-7123, Larry Elliott Clayman, at balance, versus Julia Porter et al. Mr. Clayman for the appellant, Mr. Paterno for the appellees. Good morning. Just to let everyone know, Judge Rogers is participating telephonically today. Mr. Clayman, you may begin. Good morning to my colleagues and to counsel. This is Judge Rogers. Good morning. May it please the court, Judge Millen, Judge Rao, Judge Rogers. This is a very important case, not just with regard to me, but with regard to all members of the District of Columbia Bar, or for that member, any lawyer or litigant who seeks to assert his first, fifth, and 14th Amendment rights. And I respectfully request that when you issue your decision, that you issue that in detail and go through the various points that have been set forth in our briefs, because they're very detailed and there are a number of issues. I don't have a lot of time today, but I'm going to highlight. Number one, preliminary and permanent injunctions were issued, preventing me from bringing lawsuits initially in federal court with regard to just four particular matters, cases regarding the bar. Judge uh, Wilkins, excuse me, judge went way beyond the lower court judge and what was before the court at that time. But importantly, and here's the important issue. The preliminary injunction was issued a one-line order without any evidentiary hearing under Rule 65, much less findings of fact or specific conclusions of law. Consequently, his preliminary injunction is void as a matter of law. He did not follow the federal rules of civil procedure. Now, that's even more true with regard to the permanent injunction which he issued. And of course, we know there's a very high bar in declaring someone a vexatious litigant, cases of Duro versus Mitchell, 289, F sub, third, second, DDC, 2018, in Ray Powell, 851, F second, 427. That's a District of Columbia uh, Circuit Court case, in Ray Oliver, which is 682, Federal second, 443, third circuit. We cited that. It's extreme to be able to enjoin someone, particularly who's a pro se litigant under the Sixth Amendment from asserting his or her rights. But here's why you needed a, an evidentiary hearing. There were issues of fact here. Number one, the issue is whether I had filed relevant to this case, frivolous lawsuits. I was not sanctioned in any of those cases. No one ever found them to be frivolous at all. And development of the facts of what was at issue is extremely important. And again, I turn your attention to pages 20 to 27 of our initial brief. I trust that you will read that very, very thoroughly, and I'm sure you will, Mr. because that's Clayman, the heart of it. Mr. Clayman, do you understand the authority um, for the injunction to here to be based on the inherent authority of the courts, of Article Three courts? I mean, what, what do you think is the, the source of the injunctive authority here? There is no source, Your Honor. Not in this instance. There's no source. This was totally an improper and illegal decision in all due respect. So do you it's, think that the test from Inri Powell is the relevant test, or is there a different test that we should apply? No, it's completely relevant, and so is Duro versus Mitchell, and so is the Oliver case, the cases that we cited. But let me just get to the heart of the issue, and that's why I ask you to look at pages 20 to 27. I deserve an evidentiary hearing as to whether I had filed frivolous cases or pleadings. I deserved an evidentiary hearing as to whether there was abuse of process by the District of Columbia Bar Disciplinary Apparatus. I deserved an evidentiary hearing with regard to my conduct towards judges. I have always been respectful. Yes, I have moved to disqualify judges in this court, but I've been respectful and I'm respectful now. Time and expense of what was being spent. I'm the little guy, I'm the guy that's being hurt. My time is being taken away to the point of trying to drive me into bankruptcy with everything that I've got to do with this agenda to try to remove me from the practice of law. I deserve an evidentiary hearing on the issue of whether there was bad faith under the Younger Doctrine, whether or not the District of Columbia Bar Council 
outside of his authority, was sending letters to other courts, ex parte, that I didn't even know was being sent where I practice, which cut me off from the practice of law before I had an opportunity to even exhaust all my appellate rights. Can I ask you, with respect to the, uh, the younger issue and the injunctive relief that you seek in your complaints, are you seeking um, an injunction um, against um, the future against disciplinary proceedings is number one, or the future sending of these letters to other bars, or just an injunction to get a, I know you say you haven't seen a copy of these letters. What, what is the- Good question, Your Honor. In this case, want? in this case, I was seeking just an injunction to stop tortiously interfering. It was equitable relief I sought. It wasn't even financial damage. And how? By by having them issue no letters? No by more? sending letters, by sending communications that I didn't even know about. And I requested those letters to be provided to me so I would know. I just want to break this down just so I understand carefully. And it can be, you can say conjunctions against all these things. I just want to know in your words. Yes. So you, so is one thing for which you wish an injunction is to get a copy of the letter or letters that have been sent. Am I correct in understanding and that? And to stop interfering. Is that, is that, am I yeah. correct? In, okay. In part. And then, okay, I'm not limiting you. <laughs> and two? Yeah. It sounds like to stop future issuance of letters to other bars. Is that right? In these particular proceedings that were in front of the court. Of this Judge, uh, Do you have any reason to think that these are continuing to go? Or out at this point? I do, yes, because they've loaded up disciplinary proceedings in addition to this. I do have. So those will be from other disciplinary proceedings, yes. not from this proceeding? Yes, but I, in this case, I was seeking them on those particular matters in California and in Texas and at the Ninth Circuit. And, you know, just to tell you about the bad faith, I just asked for copies of what was being sent, and they refused to provide it, disciplinary counsel. So what is a guy to do, so to speak, under those circumstances? They say, also, matter, they say the letter is a matter of public record. Have you not been able to find it's it? Not a, it? It's not a matter of public record uh, in some of the courts. In some of them, ultimately, I was able to obtain them myself after the fact. But they were not initially. I was cut off. But, I mean, but you want injunctive relief. So have you already seen the letters that were sent to Texas and California? I have not. Oh, you said you were able to see not. some letters. Which ones were you I, I think see? I think maybe the Northern District of Texas, I eventually got to see one of the letters, but I haven't seen them otherwise. No, I have not. But that's not the issue. The issue is not the letters as much as the fact that the interference is being caused. Well, with the issue for to injunctive me. relief. Uh, yes, is... I'm asking for injunctive relief. That's what I was. Okay. And that and that raises the question. There was no reason to dismiss my case. There is no immunity. I cited several cases, including the Supreme Court case that federal judges are not immune from immunity and neither are bar counsel. In fact, the case that was brought in California when that occurred with uh, the, the Ninth Circuit, for instance, California has no immunity with regard to bar counsel uh, prosecutors. There's no immunity there. So you're gonna have to face the issue of the choice of law here too. That's been brief, the choice of law. Been brief, Mr. Clayman. One, one question I had is whether um, the D.C. bar officials here should be viewed as federal officials because the D.C. courts are Article I courts created by Congress. Well, just so, so the briefing assumes that they are they are district officials, which I guess is like a quasi state. But one question I had is whether federal common law should apply to these officials because they may be federal officials. I was wondering if you had any thoughts well, about that. Well, I don't. That. I don't we didn't reach that issue in our briefs, Your Honor. I can do a supplementary brief if you'd like on that point. That's an interesting question. I don't believe that it will be treated as federal. But in any event, the immunity which was accorded by the D.C. Court of Appeals uh, is void. It does not exist. You cannot create that out of whole cloth. The D.C. City Council never gave them immunity. And there's no basis to claim immunity. It's given to themselves. And that is why they can We've already do what decided doing. that question, haven't we? I don't believe you have. Okay. And if you did, you can certainly reverse it. No, because can't. it would it would be in, it would be incorrect. Right. Well, a panel you can't, can't reverse another panel. Judge can't decide to give him or herself immunity. And just to be brief, I don't have a lot of time left here, but you know, we 
We started this country because King George III gave immunity to his judges that were rubber stamping his edicts. That was the reason why we have a jury system, as a matter of fact. Judges cannot accord immunity to themselves. And we fought a revolution, in large part, <clears throat> over that issue. But let me get to another point here, which is extremely important, and, and I can't emphasize it enough, is that Judge Walton then issued an order recently, you know, brought these cases together. And it took nine months to issue it. This is with regard to another disciplinary proceeding where I, was, I filed a Rule 60 complaint to set aside a, a decision, a suspension, which was based, as I alleged, on fraud and prosecutorial misconduct. And he enjoined that as well. He went to a state proceeding. He had no authority to do so. And he went even beyond that if you look at his order. He enjoins any other form. Does that mean I can't file a bar complaint against someone that's acting improperly? He has lost sight of his authority in all due respect, to Judge Walton. Uh, and a federal judge simply cannot do that. He has cut off my constitutional rights to defend myself against a greater enemy. This law firm here, Aiken Gump, a mega firm, represents the bar for free if they claim they've been hurt. Pro bono. They'll never have a bar complaint go forward against them, for sure. But I have to deal with it. And that's, Your Honor, is why... You know, you know who I am, and I'm a conservative activist, and I have been critical of this board, and you've been critical of me, but I have not been sanctioned here, and I hope that you can put the partisanship aside, because this decision that you're going to reach, and I hope that you'll be reasoned, it won't just be, you know, claiming you lose, okay, sorry, this is going to have far-reaching implications, not just for me, but for any litigant. It goes far beyond me, and, and that's the, the matter that is very important. Do I have any time left on uh, you don't, but I'll give you a couple of minutes for a rebuttal. We're going to hear from I you. I asked for three. Yeah. Thank you. Mr. Paterno. Hey, good morning, Your Honors. Live Paterno representing uh, defendants at Pelley's. Your Honors, in this case, the district court acted correctly and certainly did not abuse its discretion in issuing a narrowly tailored pre-filing injunction requiring Mr. Clayman to seek leave of court before, before filing another uh, claim against these specific defendants or other D.C. bar-related officials uh, that collaterally attack ongoing disciplinary proceedings. The district court bent over backwards uh, to make sure that, that it was protecting Mr. Clayman's rights while also protecting defendants uh, against further frivolous or harassing litigation. It uh, considered hundreds of pages of documents opposing defendants' motions. It held a, an hour and a half long hearing. It Mr. considered- Parker, With respect to these, these re-litigation type of injunctions, I mean, the, the number of, the record that was created here by the district court does not, rise to the level of the other types of cases where we have upheld such injunctions, which often involve, you know, dozens or hundreds of lawsuits. You know, and the rationale behind those injunctions is really to protect the inherent authority of the courts, not to protect, you know, defendants um, that may be sued. So so how does how does this injunction here fit within those cases? I mean, I know there are a couple of cases that were cited with, you know, a small number of suits. But, but here, the, the number is very different from, from the types of cases in which these types of injunctions are usually issued. Sure, Your Honor. Uh, a few responses to that. One is, uh, and certainly in, in Ray Powell, the case where this court set forth the three-factor test, it did say that the court needs to look at the number and also the content of the filings. And the following year, in, in a case that we cite called Kuiper, the court's looked at uh, only a couple of cases that had been filed there, a couple of prior filings, and conceded the number is not as great as it was in Powell, but nevertheless, because of the content of those filings, because of the numbers of motions that were filed in each case, because of the harassing nature of the filings, that that was adequate for a pre-filing injunction. And this court has not hesitated to affirm cases over and over, to affirm district court decisions over and over, issuing pre-filing injunctions in the where there's a number of case, uh, prior filings similar to here. Well, For example, in... Well, this case is different, though, because they, the, the D.C. bar continues to bring 
suits against Mr. Klayman. So there are there are new new actions being taken against Mr. Klayman against which he is you know he is defending himself. So so that's also different from a context in which a plaintiff might be just bringing new uh, you know new litigation as a kind of you know as a kind of sword rather than as a shield. Sure, your honor. Well, the analysis. Well, to, to be clear, all of the the cases consolidated and under review here in this appeal all concern the three uh, disciplinary proceedings that this court already considered in claim in one and two. Uh, and, and I think that gets to the other reason why this case is different, Your Honor, perhaps than, uh, you know, some, some of N. Ray Powell or some of the other cases. And that's the fact that Mr. Clayman's filings in this case directly contradict this court's prior holdings. It directly contradicts the D.C. Superior Court's con we prior We haven't holdings. issued any, the conduct at issue right now um, and to which this pre-suit fi pre filing, pre-suit filing injunction um, uh, pertains is the conduct of sending copies of disciplinary, sending disciplinary notices from the bar to other bars of which Mr. Clayman is a member. Have we, have any of the prior cases that you reference that he has brought involved a challenge to that sort of post adjudicatory conduct? Uh, yes, Your Honor. In, in the DC Superior Court case that we call claim in three, the court there said, in asserting that defendant Porter's, that's the same mm -hmm. defendant here, defendant Porter's conduct deviated from her scope of work as bar counsel, plaintiff, Mr. Clayman, directs the court's attention to defendant Porter's notification of plaintiff's 30 day suspension implemented by the DC Court of Appeals. This court adjudicated that issue. This court hasn't adjudicated that issue, no, Your Honor. So but there's maybe two cases where he's raised it, none of which have yet been resolved. Well, well, Your Honor, the, the issue that was resolved, and well, and to be clear, in that DC Superior Court case, Mr. Clayman this morning said he had never been, been sanctioned before. He actually was sanctioned in that case. But, but because, that's beside my point right now, which is on this question of sending letters. Right. That's new. That that specific issue is new. Yes, new Your Honor. It has not yet been before this court. That that specific issue hasn't been before the court, okay. but and it's not covered by any of our prior decisions. That that factual issue has not been covered. That That's correct. Legal issue also has not been covered. Well, well the legal issue of of defendants' uh, absolute immunity has been covered by this court, and the court. Well, made I'm not clear sure if that's true. Um, the immunities that we've spoken with before about before have involved the, for lack of a better word, about the adjudic adjudication of disciplinary violations or not. Now, the, the letters were all issued after those adjudicatory decisions became, disciplinary decisions were finalized. And they seem, at least in description, I understand from your brief, to be sort of an administrative action that is taken following the conclusion of the disciplinary proceeding. And so, you know, I don't know we, uh, how we are to understand that type of action. Is it ministerial? Is it something that automatically happens every time someone has been adjudicated to have a disciplinary vi violation? Uh, Your Honor, the, the letter, you can find it in the record. It's at uh, pages 28 and pages 128. There, there are copies of the letter that was sent from the bar. And you'll see that it's a standard letter. It's a form letter notifying other uh, bars where Mr. Clayman, uh, other jurisdictions where Mr. Clayman had been admitted to practice of the sanction that had been imposed by the DC Court of Appeals. The, the sanction was final, Your Honor, but even in his own uh, pleadings, Mr. Clayman continually insists that the, the proceedings were not final. He had filed a motion for uh, clarification, a motion for rehearing, um, that's actually, as as I understand it, that's one of his complaints is that the bar sent these, or excuse me, my client sent these out to the other jurisdictions before the proceedings were that actually finalized. Does it mean finalized. that everything that's done within a bar issuing paychecks to his employees right. is going to be covered by the immunity provision? And you said these are form letters. Um, my first question is: Are letters like this sent in every case when disciplinary con automatically when every when disciplinary that, conduct is issued. That's, that's my understanding, Your Honor. It's sent as a matter of course. that the rules don't ever anywhere 
talk about, there's no rule that actually talks about that happening, but you're representing that 100% of the cases where disciplinary conduct, disciplinary um, sanctions are imposed, suspension, whatever, um, notifications are, I know the attorneys are supposed to notify their other bars, but right. so you're telling me that the bar itself, the DC bar itself, automatically sends these letters out. Uh, it, it's my understanding the bar sends these certainly for final sanctions for, for suspensions issued by the District uh, of Columbia Court of Appeals. Okay. I can't speak to the other types of sanctions, okay. but but the bar rules do and contemplate. Who sends it? Who, is it? Is this done? You said it's a form letter. Is it done? It, it may be signed by somebody, but is it just sort of administrative staff that send these letters out? It, this was sent by one of the defendants, Your Honor, Mr. Bloom. Well, really, the defendant actually sort of put that in the envelope and sent it out, or was it, it maybe been signed by that person as a form letter? But who actually is administratively mailing these? Yeah, out? No, my understanding, Your Honor, is that assistant district uh, assistant disciplinary counsel Bloom actually, you know, looks at this the sanction that was imposed, puts together the letter mails it and that that's part of the I'm reason. asking the physical mailing of it out is done by Mr. Bloom or Ms. Bloom uh, uh he, your honor I, uh, he at least oversees it I, I obviously I, I don't know if he you know walks into the puts it in the mailbox himself or if there's I an mean, that's, that's kind but, of relevant whether it's going to be covered by uh, at least whether it's a novel question whether it's covered by absolute immunity if it's done at a ministerial level if there's I had assumed that there would be staff that would be in charge of holding and sealing envelopes and putting on stamps and putting them in the mailbox. So maybe I'm incorrect. I, I can't speak to it, Your Honor. Staff. Like this is happening in large, I mean, right. large volume if it's happening for everybody. Correct. Yes, I, I, I can't speak to the staff's involvement in the actual, as you said, putting in the envelopes, putting stamps. I assume you're, you're probably right that there's staff that does that. But, but the record shows that Mr. Bloom is the person who uh, who signed the letter and 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 directed it to the different jurisdictions? But but again, Your Honor, it's it, it is a novel question in this court. But the DC Superior Court provided to him, you know CC sure. <laughs> the person who has been disciplined. I mean, it's, it's it seems a little odd to me that there's been all this litigation where he says he can't even get a copy of it. Right. And well, yet you're saying it's a matter of public record. So why didn't the DC Bar send him a copy? I, I, I think for the reason you're saying, it is a a, a administrative burden to put all these letters together to send them out and so to, one more copy to mr clayman would have been too much well your honor what they, they went out as the complaint alleges to all the jurisdictions in which mr clayman or, or any other respondent who is sanctioned by the dc court of appeals that they goes out to all of the those jurisdictions and so uh it wouldn't just be one more letter it would be you know times two uh to to every jur you know for every jurisdiction um, but, but, but let no, me I'm ask you whether whether the the rules provide some notice um, that um, suspensions by the D.C. Court of Appeals um, those are a matter of public record. But in addition, it, the bar will notify the individual um, jurisdictions in which the member of the bar. Uh, has an active membership. Is there no notice during the proceeding? Uh, Your Honor, I know that, that DC Bar Rule uh, 11, Section 17C contemplates that uh, notice of informal admonitions could be sent by, the, by my, my clients to other jurisdictions. And I, I think that that shows that at, you know, at, at least formal admonitions, as is the case here, it would be sent, and as uh, Judge Millett, as you mentioned, the opposite. Talking statutory construction, the fact that they list one specific thing is leading to notice, whether it would make sense or not, implies that other things are not subject to that notice. It's at least entirely ambiguous. Well, I, I think it shows, Your Honor, here the relevant question is whether defendants acted within the scope of of their duties, within the scope of their authority, and I think here it shows along with the ABA model rule, along with the rules, uh, as you said, in every jurisdiction that require plaintiffs themselves to notify the courts, uh, there are rules requiring uh, the, the bar officials in every jurisdiction to obtain notice from other uh, jurisdictions. So uh, lots of these rules contemplate well, that there would be. There's nothing specific in, in the record that says they, they 
will absolutely send it. You're you're right. But you said it's just automatic, so it's even almost a ministerial duty by whoever is signing the letter. Is that correct? It's probably form letter, like you said, and the change change the name and what the discipline was, but. It's not even, I mean, would, would, would any of the disciplinary council have even had discretion not to send the letter? Uh, well, Your Honor, I think they, for the reason you said, because there's not a rule requiring mm -hmm. it, I, I think that, that they could have discretion. I think as a matter of practice, they do send it out. Do they have discretion under the DC? I mean, the problem is we're dealing now with some sort of unwritten rule that, that's not reflected in anything published. Do they have discretion or not? They, they do have discretion, but oh, then I, they sometimes don't send these letters out. Well, I, I think they have discretion, Your Honor, but I think as a matter of practice, they do send them to every, 100 percent of the time. But that's my understanding, Your Honor. Sound like discretion, but on what on what basis would they exercise discretion not to send the notice out? Well, I, I think if, uh, for example, if the the bar, well, Your Honor, the the record doesn't show and uh, doesn't speak to to that. I, I think the fact that they have done it well, in every case does not mean yeah, they don't have situation. discretion. I'm sorry, counsel. Um, did you finish your response? Yeah, yes, Your Honor. Uh, the, the, the point I was I, making I was just, just that the fact that they have discretion to send or not to send, there's, there's no requirement to send, but that does not mean that the, 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 you know, the fact that they send them in every case as a matter of course doesn't mean that they don't have the discretion. Well, my, my hypothetical would be where uh, a very um, preeminent member of the bar is sanctioned. And um, there's no question because the member of the bar says so, and he immediately files, you know, an appeal, says this is outrageous, et cetera, um, and even going to take it to the Supreme Court. And let's just suppose a hypothetical what I'm trying to understand in my own mind is, suppose as far as the D.C. Court of Appeals is concerned, uh, this lawyer should be suspended or debarred even. Um, but the lawyer, looking at it objectively, has a nice argument, whether it's a procedural or um, legal um, objection to what happened. And a lot of these situations, as you know, that even come to this jurisdiction to the D.C. bar, uh, there are due process arguments that are raised, and that bar uh, examines them to decide whether or not um, that, excuse me, that court decides whether or not it's going to apply um, complementary sanctions here. So if New York suspends someone for six months, um, but the argument is hypothetically um, that the lawyer didn't receive due process and the lawyer has some, um, at least facially, um, good argument that the court decides it needs to consider at least, and it may issue an opinion saying that in fact, uh, either it disagrees or it agrees and it's not going to uh, impose reciprocal discipline. Um, I'm trying to understand how the process works where a lawyer who has gone through the system and the process and let's hypothetically say that the sanctioning court followed all the rules, et cetera, um, but may have a good case for setting this aside. Do all those automatic letters, and suppose the lawyer, you know, practices throughout the United States, much less internationally. Um, what happened? In other words, this lawyer is pursuing an appeal, um, and it made it perfectly clear he's going to the Supreme Court with the case. Are all these other jurisdictions notified nonetheless, but the forum letter makes no mention of the fact that the suspension imposed, let's say hypothetically by the DC Court of Appeals is um, final as far as that court is concerned, but it is under active um, challenge. In other words, how does the system work nowadays? And what I'm thinking of is a lot of these rules, you will go back to King George, 
uh, the third, uh, were developed in a, in a context where uh, communication was much less instantaneous and practice was much less international, much less national. Um, and we're sort of in a different era uh, and have been for many decades. It's just what happens here. And I'm trying to hi- hypothesize poorly, I understand, a situation where a lawyer, um, as Mr. Clayman is arguing, um, he really has a good argument as to why he should not be sanctioned. And yet, during the consideration of that argument, he, in effect, is barred from practicing elsewhere. Or at least that is what the letter is suggesting that reciprocal discipline ought to be imposed. Sorry for the well, long question, but you get the gist. Yes, Your Honor. Uh, th- to be clear, the, the letter does not make any representation about whether reciprocal uh, discipline should be imposed or not. The letter, again, this is at page okay. 28 of the appendix, just says, enclosed, yeah. please, please find a copy of an order of the District of Columbia Court of Appeals disciplining the above named attorney. Our records reflect that he's admitted to practice in your jurisdiction, period. And it attaches the letter and or attaches the, the decision by the court right. of Right, so it's just information only. Uh, for, and then for, it's up to the, the other jurisdiction to decide whether to do anything. Co- correct, Your Honor. And, and of course, the decision by the, the he's DC- He's a copy of the letter. So if he doesn't know the timing of when it's gone out, then he isn't in a position to inform the other bar that, hang on, hang on, I've filed a cert petition. Right, but court, as you said, right? Your Honor, he, he already is under the obligation to notify the court. So to, to your earlier question, Judge Millett, that might be an example. Is it, to, is, it to, is it to notify when the D.C. Court of Appeals rules or when he has exhausted any further review, such as the petition for certiorari? I believe in all the jurisdictions under question here, there was an obligation to notify the court when uh, there was a final sanction imposed against them, and and that happened when. Mean, final has different meanings. Sometimes it means right. the judgment of the DC. Court. I, I think a, a sanction. All um, review has been exhausted. Right. I, I think a sanction in effect. So here, even though Mr. Clayman was was pursuing further review of the sanction, it was in effect at, at, at the time. That the decision was and, in and, and and I get your point, right. but a lot of Are the you, lawyers. Who, sorry, sorry. I just want to finish the sentence. Um, of that, course, I lost they, contact. No, no, it's so hard over the phone. You're doing great. Um, uh, the, uh, is, is it clear? Something you can cite me to that attorneys would know that they provide this notice even before they have exhausted review. Well, the the. District Court, or excuse me, the District of Columbia Court of Appeals decision made clear that the decision was was final, regardless of you know further review, or, or, or final as in in effect. Take the case, <laughs> right? Yeah. So I apologize. In terms of final, I mean in effect at that point, and right. and and so uh, to your prior question uh, about when the the disciplinary counsel's office might exercise discretion to not send a letter, I, I think if uh, a respondent in one of these cases had notified a foreign jurisdiction, uh, a jurisdiction of another state that had basically sent the same letter, then I think there would be no uh, need for- and What if you filed point. a motion for stay of the sanction mentioned here with the DC Court of Appeals? When would the, would he still have to go ahead and notify or would he get to wait for action on the stay motion? Well, I, I, I think as when the, when the sanction is in effect, again, the purpose of this rule is to prevent foreign jurisdictions, jurisdictions in other states, from uh, having a litigant in that court that has been sanctioned by another jurisdiction for some sort of uh, attorney misconduct, is to prevent them from continuing in a case without knowing about that other misconduct, uh, about the sanction because of that other misconduct. And so here, uh, that's all that that my clients did, sent this letter saying, Attached, please find the decision of the District of Columbia Court of Appeals, period. I'm sorry, Judge. Oh, oh. Huh? oh yeah. Um, so so I, had a, I, had a, I had a somewhat different question, which is, is one I also already asked Mr. Clayman. Why, um, why doesn't federal common law apply to these officials? 
Uh, well, Your Honor, that, that certainly hasn't been briefed in this case. Uh, as discussed, this court has already decided that, that Rule uh, 11, Section 19A applies and that the, the common law uh, applies because these defendants are quasi-judicial officials. So I, I think that that decision is... Decision judgment, right? Excuse me? Wasn't, wasn't that in an unpublished judgment? That was an unpublished judgment. Yeah. It was, Your Honor, but, but it cited uh, the Simons case, which is a published decision and looks at uh, D.C. But we've never, we've never said whether D.C. bar officials are federal officials or officials of the District of Columbia. And under some of our cases involving the Federal Tort Claims Act, you know, we look to see, you know, for, for D.C. entities in particular, we look to see, you know, how they were created, how they are funded, all of these different indicia about whether they should be treated as federal officials as opposed to district officials. So I, I know that wasn't briefed, but I'm wondering if you can, if you have any thoughts about that. Right. Uh, I, I don't, Your Honor. We'd be happy to, to research it and, and, and to file a supplemental briefing if Your Honor is interested. Because the standards are, are, are very different under federal common law than they would be. If the federal common law applies, then that's a different standard for immunity than under the D.C. bar rules. Right. Again, I, I do think that this case, not only in claim in one and claim in two, but also in all the cases cited in that decision, uh, particularly the Simons versus Bellinger case, uh, did apply the, the same standard that, that applies here. So we're not asking you to create an, any new ground. The district court certainly didn't create. Also, I'll just mention, I mean, if they were federal officials, then the Westfall Act might apply to them and provide immunity under the Westfall Act. I know that wasn't asserted or preserved here, but I think that would be potentially another Source of right, Your, Your Honor. I think there would there would be you know several arguments. I think the common law, federal common law, uh, applies. You know, different standards as you said, but also would apply immunity to acts taken by quasi judicial officials. Well, under the federal uh, common law, though, if it was a, it only would apply to a discretionary act, not a ministerial act. Right, and and so to, it may well be that the federal common law immunity would not cover these actions, based on the the discussion you were having earlier with Judge Millett. Right. Well, well, two responses, Your Honor. One is, again, I do think as a matter of course, these letters are sent, um, but, but I do still think it's a matter of discretion because, as we discussed, there's no specific rule requiring defendants to take this action. They, they do it as a matter of course, and they do it evenly to all respondents, but, but there's no uh, rule requiring it, and, and it does require some, uh, you know, some work to figure out what are the jurisdictions where uh, the respondent uh, has been admitted, What's the sanction that's been imposed? Those sorts of things. But, but secondly, Your Honor, um, I, I also don't want to lose sight. We've talked a lot about these letters, but of course, this case, the, the overarching point of Mr. Clayman's claims across all his cases uh, to date, and there have been a, a dozen or so, are that my clients are acting with some sort of improper motive, that they're uh, abusing uh, process by bringing these uh, investigating and prosecuting these disciplinary challenges. So he's, he's yes, uh, alleged the, that these letters are part of that, but he uh, alleges it in this broad you know, scheme that they're out to get him. And this, that's... This particular case is just about the letters, though, really, in effect, isn't it? Well, you I, take it to be broader than about the letters. I, I, I do, Your Honor. If you look at the, the district court's decision uh, where the district court compares, this is at uh, 443 and 444, Four of the appendix, he compares the complaints in this case and the complaints in the prior uh, dis, in the prior cases, and much of it overlaps. It's the it, it, here he focuses. Uh, Mr. Clayman does include this additional factual allegation about the, the letters, um, but a as mentioned, that was already decided by the D.C. Superior Court. It, it said that sending out these letters does not deviate from the scope of defendant's duties, and B's. And B, the, sending those letters, uh, in Mr. Clayman's view, is part of this broader process of uh, the, this vendetta that my clients have against him to pursue uh, him because of his political views, his ideology. Uh, and, and that is the issue that this court already decided in Clayman 1 and Clayman 2, that, those, uh, that, that absolute immunity applies and that Whatever this court said, whatever the reason for uh, prosecuting these claims, that as long as the, the actions are taken within the scope of defendants' uh, 
duties that absolute immunity applies. And here, this, this new factual allegation about the letters does not take any of the allegations outside the scope of defendant's duties. Judge Rogers, did you have a question still? Well, I, I guess I'm concerned. I think counsel responded appropriately, as did one of the questions you or Judge Rao asked. But I'm concerned a little bit, as I understood counsel, and correct me if I'm wrong, Part of your response to my concern was, well, this action taken by the DC bar officials is really designed to protect other courts from proceeding with counsel who are not properly admitted. And obviously I don't know the practices in every jurisdiction, but it's fairly common that when you're filing something, you have to make a representation to the court in which you are filing it that you are a member of the bar. So I'm just wondering what, I mean, I understand, well, maybe not every single jurisdiction does that, but um, lawyers are, are, are officers of the court to that extent. So I just wonder what's happening. This is double protection, I suppose. We're not making any comment, but certainly a lot of lawyers in this jurisdiction, even before the more modern days, practice in multiple jurisdictions, notably Maryland and, and Virginia. So I'm just wondering um, how the bar views all this now uh, and with Mr. Clayman. And I thought this case really was more focused on the abuse aspect and therefore before he could file anything more, he would have to get the approval of the court. That, but I'm hearing that, a very different argument, yeah. Well, well, you're right, Your Honor, that the pre-filing injunction here is because of the abuse uh, that that the district court found Mr. Clayman's filings continue to impose on defendants. And uh, to be clear, under the test, on the N. Ray Powell test, uh, it's disjunctive. It, it can be, uh, this is the third prong of the test. It's frivolous filings and it's harassing filings. Uh, and here the district court found both. And this, I think, goes back, we come full circle, uh, Judge Rao, to your first question. I think uh, here there's there's no question in my mind that there are uh, frivolous filings, and the district court found that, not only based on the number, uh, and that number, again, is consistent with several cases that this court has affirmed. In uh, uh, Arnold versus Secretary of the Navy, in Camper versus Brown, in Smith versus Scalia. Did the district court count this case? Excuse me? Didn't the district court count this case? The district court considered the three cases, yes, Your Honor, filed cases here. which involve a different legal question about the authority to send these um, uh, letters out, and relatedly, <laughs> well, it's well, the district courts. But um, again, Your Honor, you, if you look at, at Mr. Clayman's filings, the complaint, for example, says defendants assert false and misleading claims that they have quote absolute immunity. This absolute immunity he does may have not been in exist. There too, but he also says you. He also in, these, in the litigation before us is attacking something different. Um, so it's that the hats, and as I think we've been discussing here, has right. not yet. It's not even clear what the authority is or how it works, if it's ministerial or whether it's discretionary, but just 100% of the time they all choose to exercise it the same way. Um, or if it's written somewhere in a manual, it's, it's, it's something that simply hasn't been resolved. So surely that cannot count as either frivolous or repetitious. Well, well, again, Your Honor, it, 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 had, it was resolved by a claim in three by the D.C. Superior Court there. It, it had, you're right, Superior it hasn't court, been. Not the D.C. Court of Appeals. Right, but, but the district court was looked at, and this court's case law showed the court can look at filings in, in any sort of forum. Uh, and so with the D.C. Superior Court was looking at Rule 19A and, and the uh, common law that applies absolute immunity to quasi-judicial. Sorry, so when a, a D.C. Superior Court or a state trial court makes a ruling, a federal court has to or should 
count that ruling as sort of conclusive on frivolousness? Well, Your Honor, it's a totality of the circumstances analysis, and, and that's what the district court did here. So it looked at frivolousness, but it also looked at, at uh, harassment. That's the second prong of this, and it's a disjunctive test. And here there are uh, undisputed sworn affidavits uh, talking about the stress that these filings have caused, the embarrassment, the uh, distress, the effect to uh, retirement plans, things like that. The, the fact that Mr. Clayman has insisted on continuing to uh, serve process uh, on these defendants' homes, despite their repeated requests to just serve attorney, uh, their attorney. Um, so, so even if you're not with me on frivolousness, and uh, mm -hmm. I think here there there is a record uh, of frivolousness. Uh, and, but again, the, the harassment thing wouldn't again pertain to litigation about the authority to send these letters. That just hasn't happened before. It, it, it has not happened in this court. You're right, Your Honor, um, that, that letters. But again, the, the letters are, are just... Well, where does the D.C. Superior Court say they had the authority to issue these letters? Do you have a site for that? Uh, yes, Your Honor. It's the D.C. Superior Court case that's cited um, in our cases that is... Uh, I don't know if you had a jump site for where they talked about. If you don't, that's fine. You could send it later. It's it's uh, number 2020-CA-000756-B. And the, the court there doesn't say that there's a, a rule requiring this, but what the court says is that Mr. Clayman, like here, has offered the sending of these letters to, to other notif to notifying other jurisdictions of a suspension by the D.C. Court of Appeals that he he presented that as one of the reasons why defendants had exceeded the scope of their authority. And the district court, or excuse me, the Superior Court said, I'm not persuaded by that. The district court applied absolute immunity and said- it Didn't explain itself at all as to the authority to send this letters or how it worked. Excuse me, Your Honor? The Superior Court didn't explain itself at all, just said, I'm not persuaded and applied immunity. Well, it, it looked at this court's uh, prior- No, but it, our prior rights didn't deal with the sending letters issue. That's why I'm, I'm kind of- I think I'm not being clear here. I'm trying to right. find out if there's anything in that D.C. Superior Court opinion or any the D.C. Court of Appeals ruling, if you have one, that talks about their authority to send the letters, their obligation to send the letters, um, and, and is that considered part of, one, that's not one, that's authority, um, two, is it discretionary or mandatory slash ministerial, um, uh, uh, and, and three, is it done sort of 100 percent of the time if they have discretion? Uh, Your Honor, the, and the four, I'm sorry, four, one more thing. So the four, is it considered sort of if it's post final adjudication, is it still considered part of the disciplinary uh, adjudicatory process or is it an administrative process? which would present a different, maybe that would still fall within the scope of qualified immunity, maybe it would not. Something that simply hasn't been briefed or resolved as far as I know. Right, the, the Superior Court, to be clear, does not go into that detail on all those questions. We have no precedent as far as you're aware of on answering any of those questions? No, none on those, you're right, Your Honor, none on those specific questions. Um, but, but again, that's just a, a factual allegation that Mr. Clayman presents to support his that the two claims here are abusive process and tortious interference. And he says that my clients have uh, ha have acted maliciously based on his ideology and his, uh, his political views, and that this is an example of their uh, taking those actions. And and again, to be- I understand that. I, I totally get that. But if, if someone brings a claim, this is just hypothetical, but if someone brings a claim, uh, a complaint, and three of the claims are clearly covered by absolute immunity, um, you know, the judge ruled this way, the judge ruled against me, the judge imposed this sentence. And then the fourth claim is, um, and the clerk of the court refused to file my papers. Could that complaint be dismissed on absolute immunity grounds? Uh, there, Your Honor, I think you're right that the filing of the papers would probably be a ministerial. I don't know, actually, I'm assuming, let's assume it's purely ministerial. Right, assuming it's a ministerial duty, uh, and there, there's no discretion, th then, you know, per perhaps not. Um, but, but again, here, I, I don't think it's ministerial. The fact that, that it happens in, in every case where the District of Columbia Court of Appeals has imposed the sanction doesn't mean that it 
that there's not discretion. Right. Um, and, and, we just and, don't really know. We don't have a factual record on that. Excuse we me. We just Your don't Honor. have a factual record. There, on there's I, mean, no, I, I get your argument. It could well right. be right. Um, but we don't know. Correct. There, there's that, that's not in the record. But but the, to to zoom out, Your Honor, to be clear, mm -hmm. that the pre-filing injunction here uh, has a safety valve. Not only is it narrowly tailored, but it, it doesn't absolutely bar Mr. Clayman from bringing any action. It merely requires him to apply to any court, state court, federal court, any court where he uh, proposes to bring litigation and and to seek leave of the court. And so if there is- Can I if, ask you how that works? I'm sorry, I know we kept you a long time, but I, I don't know how this um, uh, pre-suit injunction actually works in practice. So um, if I was subject to a similar order and I wanted to go file um, a lawsuit in, uh, Eastern District of Virginia. Mm -hmm. And so I know I have to attach a copy of the disciplinary order to my complaint. And then do I have to file a motion for approval in that court? Uh, the, the language of the injunction is an application. So I, I think it is like an a, application a motion, motion for leave. Yes. Whom does that go? Does a judge have to get hauled in to decide that? Or does the clerk of the court decide it? I, I think that... The judge does, Your Honor. So a judge now has, in the Eastern District of Virginia, is now has to go familiarize themselves with the disciplinary proceeding here and contents of this complaint and make an upfront judgment about overlap? Well, you, Your Honor, the, uh, this is how it works. Right. I, well, I, I assume so. To be clear, it has not happened in this case. Right. The district court and actually district did not court enforce. You can't file this to me. Is that appealable? I, I believe so, Your Honor, and I believe that's... But to appeal, I can have to file an application with the Court of Appeals. Your Honor, that all of... Three judges have to get involved. It, it, I guess two points, mm -hmm. Your Honor. One is, is you know, this is hypothetical. I, I don't... Oh, it hasn't it happened. Happened. Right, but that, that's the second point, Your Honor. So I'm just... Right. So you... Not just um, trial level courts, but also federal courts of appeals. Well, I, I think, Your Honor, if Mr. Clayman were to seek leave from a district court in Eastern District of Virginia and that court were to deny it, I, I think then he, he likely could file an appeal. And I, I don't. The appeal require? Do you read this injunction as applies to all federal courts to require? Um, an application then to the Court of Appeals for permission to appeal? Uh, Your Honor, I think the injunction talks about cases and claims, so I don't think it would, just on its face, I, I think he probably, uh, assuming the other rules, you know, allow for an appeal, there's jurisdiction. So what, about, what about a cert petition to the U.S. Supreme Court? That is not an appeal. In, in some ways, that I, I don't know what's meant by new proceedings here or, or new, new cases. But it is not an appeal. It is a new process, a petition for review. Are those covered? Right. I, I, I don't know, Your Honor. I don't think it's covered. I, I think the initial case. Do you think it just applies to trial level courts within the federal system? I, I think it applies to the initial cases and claims filed in court. And so I wouldn't it, have to get to appeal EDVA judges' denial. Of motion to file. Right. I, th I think under this injunction that, you know, there might be other rules, the rules in the Fourth Circuit or rules of the federal. I'm just talking about the injunction. Right. I, I don't think the injunction would require that because. It's about a state appellate court. It just says state courts. It's not qualified. Right. I, I don't think that it applies beyond the initial stage of the cases, the claims, the, the injunction doesn't talk state about an appeal. Their appellate I mean, if they're discretionary review processes, I don't know if that counts as a new proceeding or a new claim for review or not under this injunction. Right. I, I think if it, if it is a new claim or a new case, then, then I think it would be covered. Um, but, but again, the, the injunction here does not apply to disciplinary proceedings, the ongoing proceedings. The district court uh, denied my client's request for it to apply to the proceeding that's in place right now in the DC Supreme Court. It's only because court. at that point the injunction doesn't say state proceedings, but going forward it's going to apply to all new disciplinary proceedings. Is that right? 
It, uh, it, it will not be the same defendant. Well, it, it, it applies to it does not apply to enjoying Mr. Clayman from uh, litigating in the proper course state disciplinary proceedings. So, for example, the, the Bundy matter that he referenced in his motion to stay, he's sorry, if they come to the district court right. to challenge an, a different disciplinary proceeding, and we'll make it a hypothetical person. I don't want to assume right, right. Mr. Clayman does things that require more action. So let's assume person X, uh, after going through this proceeding, now does something completely different. It's charged for a completely different reason to be um, a violation of DC bar rules. And uh, uh, 18 month suspension is imposed and they come to the district court and it happens to involve the same bar council or one of the same bar council. Is that covered? I think your honor, if it's the same plaintiff, it's the same defendants and it arises from the, 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 the matters that uh, are derived well, the, from the, verb these... in the, in the order is derived from. So if, if the DC court of appeals or the, the bar through its process said, Normally, this would only be a 90-day suspension, but because this is your third strike, we're going to make it 18 months. Would the challenge in district court then be derived from these disciplinary proceedings, if they're a part of the reason for the discipline? I, I, I think it would, Your Honor, but again, there's a safety valve. So Mr. Clayman can go to court and, and make the point that you're making and say, for X, Y, Z reason, this new claim, this new case that I have proposed to file uh, is not frivolous, it's not harassing. And and if he can make that showing, which is not you know, any greater than the showing that's required under, for example, Federal Rule 11 uh, to say this isn't a harassing claim, um, this isn't a frivolous claim, then then he can bring it. So it's it's not an absolute bar and and it does not apply to the ongoing disciplinary proceedings where he has been charged. There he's not bringing the case, he's, he's litigating against uh, the the disciplinary proceeding. So there's nothing to stop him in the normal course from challenging those uh, ongoing proceedings. I had just one more question if my colleagues don't have any, and that is on younger abstention. Um, what was the on, what is the ongoing proceeding at the time of the district court's ruling? Uh, well, the, there are several ongoing proceedings, Your Honor. One, uh, Mr. Clayman's complaint itself says, uh, as we discussed, that the Sataki proceeding was ongoing, that he was filing the hearing, uh, he was seeking further review of the District Court of, uh, excuse me, District of Columbia Court of Appeals sanction. So that, that proceeding was ongoing. That's the one in the filed. D.C. Superior Court? Uh, that, that was the, no, Your Honor. The, <laughs> it is confusing. There are a lot of these. That when, when he filed his uh, claims in all three of these cases, mm -hmm. the, he was not when he filed his claims, when the district court ruled what was ongoing. Right. So, so when he filed the claims, the, the Sataki proceeding was still ongoing um, because he was challenging it when he filed. Sataki in district court? So, no, Your Honor, the, the, the disciplinary proceeding. That's the one he, he was, he, he says that the, the bar council erred by sending these notices because he was continuing to challenge the sanction. That, that was the ongoing proceeding at that time. Secondly, there's the, the Bundy matter, uh, which is the subject of his motion to stay uh, filed in the last few weeks. That's an ongoing proceeding. seeking an injunction against the sending of the letters relate to an ongoing proceeding the, there may be there may be there are invariably some ongoing proceedings right. in this suite of litigation right. um but but the the injunction sought against the letters is that part of any ongoing proceeding well that again your honor when when mr clayman filed the case the proceedings were ongoing uh, in that sataki matter because he was seeking further review of the court of appeals sanction for any other questions? Judge Rogers, do you have any questions? No, thank you. All right, we've kept you up a long time helping us to understand this whole process. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. I ask that you. Thank you very much. All right, now, Mr. Clayman, we'll give you three minutes. Your Honor's asked some very good questions. Fortunately, 
my learned counsel over there didn't have the answer. Do you have the answer? And I'm, I have the answer. There, there is no District of Columbia rule, disciplinary rule that requires to send those letters. There's nothing in there to that effect. Number two, Your Honor raised a very good question. If this was proper, why wasn't I copied on it? That's ordinary professional practice. Do I know what was at stake? With regard to the Ninth Circuit, they made reference to an ongoing matter concerning Sataki, suggesting that I'm going to then be suspended for that when I hadn't even been suspended. That created a lot of problems and a lot of issues. I had my bar, uh, I had my ability to file taken away, I had my ability to represent clients taken away in the Northern District and the Western District. Uh, this is serious. And for them to cavalierly come up here, and, and he was just pulling that out of a hat. He doesn't have any basis for 90% of what he said when he was up here, in all due respect. He's making it up. There's nothing in the record. And that was a good question Your Honor asked, too. There's nothing in the record. And there is. Have you had to, um, excuse me, have you had to file one of these applications yet? And if so, can you tell me what the process was? Or have I, you not had to do that? I, yet? I don't know the process. And that's another reason why Judge Bolton's orders have you are. Tried? Another jurisdiction. Have you had to do? Have you tried yet in another jurisdiction? I'm, I'm, I'm reaching the point of contemplating doing that, mm -hmm. but here's the problem: is that Judge Walton's orders, you know, all two of them, actually three, the preliminary injunction, which had no findings of fact and conclusions of law, no evidentiary hearing, the preliminary, the permanent, which also had no uh, hearing under Rule 65, so I could explain these issues. This record would have been developed if we had had that hearing. There's no hearing. So consequently, those orders are of no force and effect. They should be vacated. And number three, void for vagueness. Your Honor's raising all these questions, and these issues weren't addressed by Judge Walton. He just simply, in a blanket way, said, you can't file any more cases. Now, he also said in his most recent order, don't, in effect, don't come back to me. If you read it carefully, saying, I already denied your motion for stay. I'm not going to listen to you again. That's why I have one here on this basis. He did not enjoin me just from federal court or from state court. And I do submit that the Superior Court is the equivalent or the DC courts are the equivalent of state, but he enjoined from any other forum. My God, I mean, this is unbelievable. I've never seen anything like this. I've been practicing law for 46 years. Now I understand there's an institutional bias. I'm Larry Clayman, and this is the DC bar. But DC Bar has to play by the same rules as its members. It used to have on its website a provision that everybody's to be treated equally, both people that are complained about, lawyers that are complained about, and the complainants. I'm not being treated that way. Now, this is a matter, by the way, and this is a statement that was simply false. That's still being challenged. I have a Rule 60 action in the Superior Court that was filed. That's the subject of where... Judge Walton begrudgingly said, okay, you can continue with that because I just said federal. But am I, do I have to apply now when I ever, when I exercise appellate rights or Rule 60 rights because there's been false testimony? Well, he said it doesn't provided. apply to appellate things. Well, um, what he says doesn't really matter. So the, that's a fair point. The, um, uh, there's, there's other matters that have been disciplinary actions that have been taken against you. Um, that have been final, that precede this litigation with Judge Walton. Do you know if letters were sent out to bars in any of those cases? I don't, Your Honor, and they say they have no obligation to tell me. Okay. And there's nothing in the record to reflect one way or the other what they have done. You know, one other, one, one other point is that this takes time. With regard to the Bundy matter. What takes time? to go through this application process if that was applicable, which it's not, I submit. But with the Bundy matter, when that went to a hearing before the ad hoc hearing committee, they could not find that I committed any ethical violation. That's very unusual. And they didn't take supplementary evidence at that time on sanction. But DC bar rule says they must issue a ruling within 60 days, the ad hoc hearing committee. They didn't issue it for four years from they only issued it recently because I believe they know that my other suspension is, is going to end in March, March of next year. But by the time this thing goes through the board and the D.C. Court of Appeals, they want me to be suspended again. 
And this, and the, and, and, and this is unbelievable. There's a case in Florida. Uh, I, th I think we filed it in, a, in another pleading, which says that Bar Council can't hang back and wait for a suspension to conclude before filing another proceeding. And this is why I have to be able to react quickly to these things, because hopefully I'll get a judge who will listen to what I have to say. Judge Walton, you know, he's a nice man, but he, he, I think he got offended when I said, have you read the pleadings? Because I didn't think he had understood what the issues were at that time. Okay, thank you. Do my colleagues have any further questions? Uh, no, thank you. Thank yeah, you. And I just, that I, case is submitted. Thank you. All right, thank you.